Hi folks, it's uh, Thinking Slow here. Uh, we wanted to do an episode today about the model, the uh, model that was used to kick off the whole uh, lockdown process uh, two years ago. So today is roughly the two year anniversary of two weeks to flatten the curve. And we want to do this episode because we're pretty sure that whatever subsequent uh, public inquiries and investigations the authorities are going to conduct, they will never actually tell you what really went wrong. And the reason they won't do that is because that points to some very serious culpability amongst the actors involved in this catastrophe. And that is not something that our political class will allow to happen. So we will do that in this episode. Um, and I think we'll thread together a lot of things that you may not be aware of. And I think you'll find certainly towards the end, the conclusion quite shocking. Uh, anyone that uh, dialed in for Ukraine news, um, just a quick update to say that our basic proposition that we made about three weeks ago, that actually this was something that was initiated by the warmongers in Washington in order to destabilize and weaken Russia, um, and therefore it's not something they're, they're in a hurry to stop through a ceasefire. This is actually something they're going to encourage. Um, that, that basic proposition has unfortunately seemed to have played out and that is now being said out loud. Um, and, and I think that goes a long way to explaining why there's very little move from the West to get a ceasefire on this situation. So that's that. But um, today is really about the model and uh, I think you're going to find this interesting. Uh, so this starts off with the infamous model from Imperial College on the 16th of March 2020. And uh, we put this up a few times now, but even even us with no prior knowledge of uh, epidemiology, we knew uh, by very well early by the end of April that something was significantly wrong with the model. And we put in uh, this pinned tweet that you can see from 2020. Th this was the infection fatality ratio, which was in the imperial model. Uh, versus other um, other estimates for the same number from different sources. So Center of Evidence-Based Medicine. medicine. Uh, this was an antibody study in Santa Clara. And uh, this is uh, implied from the Diamond Princess actual data. So you can see even people with no real knowledge uh, of epidemiology could figure out that the model was essentially significantly overstated and, th and that's always been the case uh, and I'll walk you through how that uh, how that happened and also uh, I'll walk you through the fact that the that the politicians knew from 2020 also that the lockdown was massively more damaging than COVID itself as a disease so they knew for many years uh, that the cure was worse than than the disease in this case so uh, let's start with the first uh, big um, finding that blew the Imperial College model out of the window. And this this is from Professor Levitt, which was uh, this was issued on the 25th of March 2020, just a few days after the Imperial paper came out. And I'm obviously not going to go through all the numbers, but what he basically did was uh, he multiplied out the infection fatality ratio provided by the Imperial College model by the population of people on the Diamond Princess and came out to the expected number of people who would die uh, with this age distribution, which was 58. And he basically said that the, the number of people actually did die on the Diamond Princess was seven. Um, and there's quite a few caveats here. But anyway, that this is the basic rub of his argument. And therefore, the Imperial model is overstated by a factor of 8.3. And that's just basically simple maths. And um, <clears throat> uh, this this is, I think this points to the correct conclusion that uh, there was a massive inflation of the infection fatality ratio. Uh, but but I think you can tell with low numbers, you know, if this seven becomes eight, uh, you start to get a different, uh, you start to get a different multiple. So when you're dealing with low numbers like this, it's easy for these ratios to go up and down quite a lot. So this should be just seen as an estimate because I think this would understate actually the infection fatality ratio. But in any event, he's showing that this is multiple times higher uh, in the Imperial College model than you would expect from actual data. And actual data should always 
trump the model. And this is one of the fundamental things that went wrong that they will never admit. Um, this is um, a very important interview that then Professor Levitt gave um, not long after making those calculations, which he posted up on the website, his website, which I'll give you a link to. Um, and this is amazing because in this interview, uh, this is this is literally what he said. This was the response from the scientific community when he raised these concerns. They all just said, stop talking like that, uh, which that is very, very spooky. Um, I think this points to a sort of deep problem we have in this system in inverted commas that uh, any dissent is silenced in this way. Now, Professor Levitt is a Nobel laureate. I mean, he is not your average uh, uh, sort of blogger or um, a guy tweeting out a few numbers from the back of an envelope. You know, this guy is the business. I mean, he is a Nobel laureate. And when he came up with this, uh, which clearly is challenging the uh, the establishment with a capital E, uh, he was told to stop talking like that, which I find is very, very scary. And I think that is really the bottom line of what's gone wrong here. We're dealing with a sort of establishment who will plow on and pursue their own agendas regardless of, of anything else and will shut down any dissent and any opposition. And we've seen that over and over. This is this is not a good system. Um, so moving on, uh, here is our own uh, little experiment at trying to come up with a forecast for what may happen with um, with COVID based on the data from the Diamond Princess. And uh, th there's a lot of detail in here, but basically we came up with about 160,000 deaths for the UK and that's that's what we ended up with and our basic proposition is all of the theatre with the masks uh, and many other things that I can't mention on YouTube uh, ha have not made a material uh, impact on the final outcome which is roughly uh, at this number and as I said this number would be slightly higher than uh, taking Professor Levitt's uh, divide by 8.3 but it's it's the same. It's the same approach. Similar, uh, similar use of numbers from Diamond Princess, and again, actual numbers should always, always trump the model. If the uh, if the actual numbers don't match the model, it's the model that's wrong, not the other way around. Um, so this uh, this was already known by the twenty fifth of March, twenty twenty. That's how early this was known. That 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 the imperial infection fatality ratio was overstated by a magnitude of, you know, anywhere from eight, eight's too high probably, but six is more realistic. So another uh, key part of this puzzle that um, makes me think uh, there's been a lot of bad behavior and dishonesty, particularly from Professor Ferguson, uh, is this um, testimony he gave a few days after producing the paper uh, which came up with that infamous 500,000 deaths in an unmiti unmitigated pandemic. Uh, he's asked a question, so so 510,000 more people will die? And then he gives this quite slippery answer. Um, well, it depends what you mean by excess deaths, because um, I'm going to read this out because I mean, by the end of the year, what proportion of people who died from COVID-19 would have died anyhow. It might be as much as half to two thirds of the deaths we are seeing from COVID-19 because it affects particularly people who are at the end of their life or with prior health conditions. Now, he just issued a paper nine days before this statement uh, where he forgot to mention that the 510,000 deaths would include uh, people, so up to two thirds of that number would be people who would die of other causes because they were at the end of their life. Now that's a massive omission. I don't doubt, I personally, I don't doubt for a second that that omission was deliberate. And we'll explain why that is because this is part of the modus operandi uh, of this gentleman and how he operates. Uh, this, this I find amazing that was never mentioned in the paper that was released uh, just a few days prior to this. Um, uh, this uh, hearing at the select committee, absolutely astounding. So here, here is another very useful benchmark um, about how much of a risk COVID really was. Um, 
again, I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but basically um, the, the, this is uh, the chance of dying from COVID expressed as the number of days of, of normal life risk. So, you know, the, the chance of me dying from COVID uh, is the chances of me just sort of living in 11 days of life uh, if I'm in this age group, so 25 to 34. So, you know, th th this is just a, a couple of weeks of ordinary life, which you would never think about what's my risk of dying. But that's all that COVID was for these age groups. And even in the elder age group, the risk of dying from COVID was the risk of 36 days, 40 days of ordinary life. Now, you can see here immediately that spending two years to disrupt your life completely in order to avoid 40 days of risk is completely crazy. Um, I mean, you can look at the maths. I think it's intuitively obvious what he's trying to say here. Um, but it, it puts into perspective, you know, this is not the existential threat uh, that we were led to believe. And again, this is actual data. I've got some other issues with this, but based on actual data, we're talking about 30, 40 days of risk, even for the for the most elderly and, you know, virtually nothing for younger. And this again now, when we get into lockdown, this is important to remember this perspective. We are in theory avoiding, you know, a few days of risk by destroying years of life. It's uh, from here, I, I hope everyone can understand it never made sense. Um, and just finally, one more data point on the actual risk or two more data points on the risks we actually faced. Uh, this is kind of interesting. This is the uh, the green line is the daily death in France uh, from a heat wave in 2003. And the red line is daily deaths from COVID in 2020. Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's amazing that you can see that this uh, August 2003 heat wave in France, you had a lot more daily deaths than you ever did with COVID uh, in the first wave in 2020. Again, I think that puts it into perspective, you know, how how far out of perspective we got this basically and how, how that modeling number uh, set this whole deadly chain in motion. So the other aspect of the imperial model was the dynamic of the way that the disease would spread. Now, if you remember those sort of sombrero curves you had in an un unmitigated pandemic, you had 80% 80, 80 of the population getting ill over a sort of two and a half month period. So you had this gigantic spike which drove the demand for healthcare services. Now, it's pretty obvious that no country in the world can have a healthcare system that can cope with 80% of the population getting ill. Uh, straight away. It just, it's impossible to set up a system like that. So already in the assumptions, um, it was already input that, that there was no way in the world that the health system could cope. Now, there's two data points that show you how wrong that dynamic was. So we've already shown that the infection fatality ratio was massively overstated. But the, the real then point is how quickly those deaths and illnesses take place. And over a period of two and a half months, it's completely impossible to cope with that. So here's here's the easy illustration is the number of beds that were emptied. So 53,700 beds were emptied uh, in preparation for COVID. Now, the maximum utilization of those beds on the 7th of April was 29%. So 71%, which is 38,000 beds were empty, but they were never used. And that basically shows you, uh, again, that they were wrong in the dynamic of how this was going to spread and wrong by, you know, multiples, not by a few percent. Again, when we're looking at these, you know, is it wrong by a multiple of six or multiple of eight? You know, these are multiples, like nobody in the real world can afford to be wrong by a factor of five or six. Now, whatever it is you happen to be doing, pricing something, analyzing uh, an investment, whatever, you cannot be wrong by a factor of five or six. I mean, you can be wrong by 10%, 20% and survive, but you know, these guys are wrong by multiples and apparently it's fine. Um, and, and also the ventilators was another uh, example where they essentially acquired, um, roughly speaking, they ended up acquiring about 20,000 ventilators together with the existing capacity 
um, and there was never more than 4,000 uh, people needed ventilation. So again, we're wrong by a factor of five here. And, and that's quite consistent with what we had. We had six on the infection fatality ratio. You've got five here and you've got about three and a half here. I mean, this is these are multiples uh, of being wrong. And actually, uh, it's not an OK um, excuse to say that oh you need to build a worst case scenario so you can sort of plan around that the pandemic modeling instructions tell you specifically you can't model to a worst case because if you do that you can misutilize resources you have to model to a reasonable worst case so it has to be possible it can't just be okay let's get the worst possible and work to that because everybody understands that isn't that isn't effective. So you have to work to a reasonable worst case. So just saying, well, you know, it's better to err on, on the side of caution is wrong. And also, I think what I really wanted to say is, again, look at these dates. You know, April 2020, you already see that these beds are not needed. March 25th, 2020, Professor Levitt's already telling you you're out by a multiple of eight on the infection fatality ratio. So very early on, we know these assumptions were wrong. And just sort of wrapping up then on severity, you know, this is the age standardized mortality. This is fact. This is from Office of National Statistic now. You know, again, we, we were sold an existential threat, which a number of the talking heads were pushing. Now, look at this uh, on an age standardized basis because the population is getting older over time. Okay, we did have a spike up in death numbers, but you know, on any kind of perspective on a long-term scale, this is not worth essentially destroying the economy and children's education for. It just doesn't, it doesn't add up. And again, the model was the domino that, that really got all the others falling. This was the, the first step in this chain of events. So, and then lastly, um, not lastly, but just before concluding, I wanted to go also through one really, really important thing about the lockdown. So I'm not going to get into all the maths about the lockdown, but again, um, by about summer of uh, 2020, again, remember this 2020, you know, we're still fiddling around with lockdowns and who knows what by the end of 2021. Now, in early 2020, not only was the model disproven, but uh, there was a lot of uh, findings coming out about the lockdown itself not being effective. And then this is something even we did in May 2020. There was no correlation between the severity of lockdown and COVID deaths. So you, you have actually had no evidence whatsoever that you were achieving anything from lockdown. Now, the most amazing chart in all of this that I still think even today hardly on anyone really understands is that in, in one of the SAGE documents from July 2020, they did an evaluation of the impact of lockdown in terms of quality adjusted life years. Um, and they, in this chart, this is again directly from SAGE, it's not a blogger or a conspiracy theorist, this is from SAGE on a big, big report from the Office of National Statistics. These are all the impacts on um, life years. So, you know, they're saying emergency care is going to be affected. That'll cause uh, a loss of life years. Um, Non-urgent elective surgery, that's, that's going to cause an impact on life years. A huge impact from recession and deprivation. Um, and if you add all of these up, you get to 900,000. Now, you compare that to COVID, Category A direct COVID deaths. You can see here already that the impact of lockdown is higher than from COVID itself. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail because I think this conclusion on its own is kind of amazing. Um, and, and again, you know, ever since July 2020, we've been hearing people moaning about it's time to do a cost benefit analysis. Well, listen, guys, there is a cost benefit analysis. It was done. Nobody read it. That was the issue. Um, nobody in the press picked this up, or if they did, they ignored it. I don't think anyone, I, I sometimes get the feeling nobody even read this document, which is linked in the notes at the end. But, you know, one of the details is this number, in our view, is very, very inflated because this includes some unrealistic assumptions about life years uh, that were left of people dying of COVID. And that, that's a 
we've done a technical paper on on that but um we think actually you know adjusting for something more realistic than the assumption they used the impact of lockdown was around about five times higher than from covid so you know the the, the cure is five times worse than the than the disease and our colleagues at panda nick hudson has done a paper also very early on you know again look, let's remember we're talking about summer 2020 and nick hudson before even july 2020 did a paper for south africa where his um, their estimate was that the impact of lockdown was 29 times the impact from covid in terms of lo lost uh, life year life life years lost uh 29 it's really incredible and we're going to come back to this because ultimately this is a question of politicians being prepared to have all of these deaths which are less visible obviously um you know these deaths will 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 take place over many years into the future but based on the fact that we've destroyed the economy um and they're quite willing to tolerate this because this is low profile this is you know, this is people dying of, at home of heart attacks, which has been a very big problem throughout this whole process. But the, these deaths could be um, in, a, in a hospital ward in a corridor. And that's a photo. Uh, that's a photo question. You know, if that photo is on the front page, that's unacceptable. But these deaths, no problem. It doesn't matter that they can be a multiple of these deaths. And I think this is one of the issues we want to get into, really, you know, the sort of politics um, and interest groups driving a lot of this because this is not about health at this stage if you're implementing a policy which you know to be damaging you're not doing anyone any favors um, at least at the population level so let's just um, bring this in and um, I think we've done other videos on this but you know our position has always been yes there is a disease called COVID yes people died from it i mean i've had it so um there's no i'm not denying it exists and i'm not denying it's pretty unpleasant and obviously for certain people it's fatal um but i think like a lot of things uh this quite cynical approach of uh, never let a good crisis go to waste uh we can see pretty clearly that the world economic forum and their sort of deindustrialization degrowth strategy latched onto COVID and lockdowns and um, pretty soon after this whole process started you get these um, favorable favorable um, statements about lockdown so uh, there's a lot of things on the World Economic Forum about how good lockdown was in terms of reducing traveling and CO2 emissions uh, etc etc and this this is from the, the book and, and the clue is in the title COVID-19 the Great Reset I mean, there's clearly a link and uh, it doesn't matter how many of these fools in the mainstream media call you conspiracy theorists, you know, the link is in the title of the book. And if you just read it, you'll see pretty clearly that uh, these uh, World Economic Forum agenda points have been grafted onto COVID. And, and this is the clearest paragraph um, from the book from Klaus Schwab that they, they want to achieve, achieve structural changes in behavior. This is what this is all about, social engineering, top down models of how society should work and what you and I can and can't do. And, uh, and, and look at all these agenda items, you know, we can't basically the the pandemic response has forced us to change all of these habits, uh, use of cars, flying, eating, heating our home. And they basically want that to be permanent. Um, and there's plenty more paragraphs that go on and on about this, basically uh, working remotely, all of the, and you know, more cycling. These are all of the things that we're seeing in this net zero program and all kinds of other policy initiatives. So I think it's ludicrous to assume that um, lockdowns turned up um, and, uh, and these agenda items weren't furthered uh, through, through use of lockdown and promoting lockdown. And actually, you know, the three well, three of the key globalists, Bill Gates, uh, George Soros and Klaus Schwab, uh, very early in the whole COVID um, pandemic were very vocal about COVID being an existential threat. And I think if you think back to that um, age standardized mortality rate, you can see that's not true. So this this was um, this was hyped because when they say something in the media, it, it obviously gets a lot of attention. 
and they use that platform to basically push um, an existential threat from COVID. Although, as I said before, from March 2020, based on the work of Professor Levitt, it was clear that wasn't the case. But anyway, we pushed on with these uh, uh, with this huge uh, policy overreaction. So just wrapping up then, we're going to look at the interest groups that benefited from this draconian policy response, because there are people that benefited from this, you know, not you and I, but there are interest groups that benefited. And one of the more important um, analysis uh, that was done during this whole uh, lockdown was uh, by Lord Sumption about what this means for uh, democracy and uh, politics in the UK. And I just read the first couple of lines because they're important. The government has discovered the power of public fear to let it get its way. It will not forget. Um, and then he goes on to say that this is um, about democracy too easily subverted by demagogues seeking to obtain or keep power by appeals to public emotion and fear. And I think he's put uh, here exactly what's gone on. And he, he goes on to explain that we'll be basically left with a, with a shell of a democracy. So we'll go through the motions, but democracy plus minus is, is finished because this is the new way of exercising power uh, through emotional manipulation and fear. And everything I've seen uh, from the beginning of this right to now is sort of confirming that. So, uh, so just wrapping up then, um, I think what we wanted to say in this presentation is that those problems that we saw with the model, uh, they were clear pretty early on in this process, already by March 2020, almost straight away. The actual data from Diamond Princess is showing you there's a big problem with the model. The 70% plus of empty beds uh, were also showing you there was a big problem with the model. The numbers were wrong. Uh, the July 2020 analysis that showed you lockdown causes more damage than COVID. That's a big problem. Now, remembering all of this stuff kept going on almost for a year and a half after those dates, you know, nothing was stopped. Uh, these people kept not only kept their jobs now, but they will be rewarded. So the system will circle the wagons, they'll sweep a lot of stuff under the carpet. Uh, they'll claim they're dealing with uncertainties that were evolving over time. And Yes, a couple of slip ups were made, but generally everything was fine. That's not true at all. These guys got this wrong and people pointed that out and those people were shut down and the system carried on. And the only way there's going to be accountability for these guys is through the private legal actions of Dr. Sam White and others. The system will not will not look at itself in the mirror and make changes. So. It needs to be individuals pursuing legal claims for malfeasance, etc. And uh, I wish them the very best of luck on that because these guys need to have those claims put against them. They have been, uh, there, there has been malfeasance in, in our view. Um, the other problem we realize now is that uh, we never realized before is there's a lot of what I would call sort of leftist kind of thinking. So people who are sort of myopically focused on their one little topic. They don't understand trade-offs. You know, it's the classic kind of left-wing money tree idea that just the government must do something, just throw money at it. And there's never any trade-off. There's never any counterbalance. And, you know, this was certainly the case here. You know, we focused on one thing, you know, the NHS beds, that's it. Nobody cares about anything else. It doesn't matter. The whole rest of the country can collapse. And we now have... Uh, debt to GDP of just over 100%. The, the United States uh, debt to GDP ratio is now back where it was in 1947. So we've wrecked the economy because we have these hyperactive sort of leftists focusing on their one issue. And not only are they hyperactive, but they're very aggressive as well. Um, and they, they're very um, friendly with the media. So they get enormous amount of media coverage. I mean, if you, we, we already looked at this before, but um, communist, uh, communist Mitchie uh, was in the paper every single day, fear mongering about COVID. And, you know, this is essentially sort of one left leaning group in, in the sort of Gramsci march through the institutions way through through academia, through media, through these other other areas. This is a this is a tight group of people and um, one feeds into the other. 
and uh, you know media I think we've also understood promoting fear you know if it, if it bleeds it leads um, fear sells newspapers and then of course the whole of the media complex was completely dependent on the government throughout COVID so that creates another enormous conflict of interest and uh, that together with the Ofcom warnings mean that there was there was no chance of the media really ever questioning anything that was going on, although everything we have in here is all public source. I don't have any particular secret information. I got some insights from people that I can't mention here, but the data is all out there. Just look for it. But the media was never going to do that uh, because of the money, the Ofcom rules, and because, you know, this is essentially, in fact, probably this, these three is essentially... Uh, one group of people and then of course they're heavily influenced by the oligarchy we've already covered that and again it doesn't matter how much the mike grams of this world laugh this off this this is pretty well a fact and the, the evidence for that we've already produced in the analysis we did of dominic cummings's testimony where bill gates is mentioned i can't remember the exact number of times but it's a heck of a lot of times basically and it's clear he's influenced by by gates and people around gates so you know that's that's the uh, that's the definitive proof really in terms of influence which is quite quite hard to find it's it's influence obviously is is very rarely leaves a trail and you can't find it, anything documented but in that testimony it's pretty clear the enormous influence bill gates has and that's you know on top of then all of the money uh, that he's putting into the policy development process and uh, the last thing uh, that we've seen in this, and I'm going to give you the link on the next page, is a very important blog by Tom Jefferson of the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine, where he talks about, in 2017, he was talking about the dangers of revolving door between big pharma and policy setting, with all of our policy setting chief medical officers being ex-pharma executives. Um, that's a dangerous position. And again, you know, going back to the people that won and lost from this, you know, all the winners were in, you know, big pharma, big business, the wealthy um, demagogue politicians and um, and sort of health health establishment. I guess you could call it people grabbing enormous amounts of power. You know, those were the winners uh, and everybody else was the loser. And we're, we're going to have to pay for that for a long, long time to come. And whatever... Uh, official sort of investigation or public hearings they're going to be will not basically put these events together in the way we've just done in this presentation and you know again it's all open source it's all public knowledge if anyone really had any interest in getting to the truth they could just as easily put this as uh, together as we did but I know they won't do that so that's it for today um here are the links, and I, I'm going to post this as I usually do, but do have a look at this one, which maybe not that many people have seen. It's the Tom Jefferson blog from uh, 2017 warning about the revolving door policies, because that's an additional piece of the puzzle. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, you know, this is our take on our anniversary. A lot of things went wrong. It's clear a lot of things went wrong early on, but nonetheless, the machine carried on. And we think the machine carried on because of the interest groups pushing the machine. And those interest groups basically won at our expense. And we'll have to pick up the pieces and pay for this for many years to come. Thank you. Goodbye.